hi and welcome let's just jump into this all right so that little diddly you saw at the beginning there was me playing on my buddy's uh les paul uh nice guitar that was my whole band reckless angel that was my first kind of like pro band not my first band but my first kind of pro band uh yeah we had a lot of fun uh, okay, today's topic is why you should buy a $10,000 guitar. Dun, dun, dun. Well, I don't think you should have to buy a $10,000 guitar. I would, I would never manufacture a law that says you have to go and buy a $10,000 guitar. I would never do that. I would never uh, force somebody at gunpoint to go buy a $10,000 guitar. Never. But I, I see these arguments of, and it, it goes something like this. Uh, the guitar you bought is junk, it's crap because you know you didn't pay enough for it. The counter argument is, oh, you're just trying to validate your purchase uh, because you spent way too much money and you're, you're butt hurt when somebody calls you out that you've spent too much money on a guitar. And I'm like, well, can there be some reason in between why you'd buy an expensive guitar? Not necessarily a $10,000 guitar, but why would you buy a guitar at 500 bucks? Why would you buy a guitar at 300 bucks? Why would you buy a guitar at 800, 1600, uh, 2000, 3800, uh, you know, 10,000, whatever it would be, you know, like why would you pay more for a guitar? Um, and it's a really crazy thing because if you think about it, pretty much all guitars, uh, not including the quality of the materials involved really don't require any more effort to make them you know if we're talking hollow bodies maybe that yeah because there's a lot of work into a hollow body but uh, or semi hollow bodies uh, a contour uh you know like violin top uh curved like you know like les paul's and and double cut uh, Paul Reed Smiths and stuff like that. Yeah, okay, yeah, there's a little more work into those guitars, extra binding, yeah, a little bit extra work there. Uh, now, this is my guitars folder, but it also includes violins and, and mandolins and any instrument I've ever owned. So uh, you, you might see some of those in there. So just discard those and whatever. Um, but anyway, yeah, like for example, this is a $150 TCM guitar. That's my first solid body guitar. I gave it to my sister and I. So why would I buy an SG3 that's worth more than 10 times the price? You know, you know what I mean? What am I getting more? And I think a lot of people get kind of lost in what an overpriced guitar is and what an overpriced guitar isn't. And the way I look at it, for example, you just saw a picture of my SG3 and my SG61 review issue. If you price out SGs right now, the SG standard is going for something like 2400 bucks which i think is way overpriced for what it was because uh not even 15 years ago it was a 1200 dollar guitar which i thought was just about perfectly priced for what you were getting i mean you were getting a guitar for 1200 bucks that had dressed frets that's almost unheard of you know what i mean uh, that kind of thing right you know, guitars under two thousand dollars typically don't have dress frets. Uh, I bought my SG3 for fifteen hundred and sixty bucks plus tax and everything. I think came out to about eighteen hundred. And I mean, it was like a poor man's SG custom for eighteen hundred bucks. You know what I mean? Like it was, and but it's a phenomenal guitar. It sounds freaking killer. Uh, it sound it plays incredibly amazing. I mean, I've had the guitar since two thousand six, and I've yet to do an adjustment on it. You, you know what I mean? Like, okay, yeah, when I bought it, I, I, I lowered the action to my liking, but other than that, and I, I re-intonated, uh, you know, whenever I'd changed, like, different gauges of strings, I tried flat wound, <coughs> 10, uh, 10 gauge flat wounds on it, so I had to re-intonate a bit for those because they were a little higher tension or whatever, and then I went to 11 gauge strings, went back down to 9 gauge, hated 9 gauge uh, strings on it, now I'm back at the standard 10 gauge strings been that way for about a decade with that guitar and I've had that guitar for 17 years uh, well since 2006 so yeah about 17 years and the thing about it is is that I look at that guitar and I'm like bang for the buck it is a really tough guitar to beat in its genre like you know you could pay two thousand dollars for a lot of guitars right that won't even come close to what that sg3 can deliver right 
that said it delivers a certain thing that like it'll never do what my Jackson Flying V or 5T does and vice versa those two guitars are like different animals they don't really they don't really they're, they're meant to do different things right and both guitars are about the same price you know the SG slightly more expensive uh, but like when you look at it it's like okay both guitars are with you know like they're both excellent and phenomenal guitars like both of them are phenomenal uh, some people say well no, the Jackson is much better whatever well the Jackson is better for metal uh, that type of thing but when you play clean although it has a cleaner clean tone it doesn't have the, the Jackson Flying V my R5T which you'll see pictures of it uh, later on that Pro Mod Rhodes model it sounds good clean but the Gibson sounds way better clean you know what I mean uh, if you want a vintage classic rock sound you grab the SG all the time uh, it just sounds better for that with the shorter scale length and like that that said you want modern metal tones you grab the, you grab the Flying V right and both guitars are roughly about the same money you know uh, although bought you know a decade and almost two decades apart though uh, that said it's still one of those things that bang for the buck both guitars are built to price they're built or not built to price but they're built at the right price so if someone would say well I'd never buy that Gibson for 1560 bucks or 1800 bucks because it's too expensive but it's a guitar that I've kept for 17 years because it's such a great guitar and at one point it was the only guitar I had you know with the exception of one acoustic uh, and it's just like it fulfills you when you get a really good quality guitar that does what you want so for example I've never been a Stratocaster guy I'll probably never be a Stratocaster guy doesn't mean I don't want a Stratocaster just to have one I've always liked Telecasters more than I like Stratocasters and I you know would probably buy the Strat before the Tele just because of the, the versatility uh, of the um, five-way switching versus three right uh, but that said the tones of a tele uh, like a tones of a telecaster or for clean tone is almost unbeatable uh, it's like the ultimate solid body clean tone you can get is going to be like those little lady finger single coils in, in the telecaster it's going to be the twangiest guitar you got but it's also going to be which makes it great for country and 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 whatever but uh, uh, you know no good for metal right it's no good for metal so again different animal whatever but how much do you pay for a good Telecaster well Telecaster is a strange guitar even the cheap ones typically sound good usually the pickups are junk but the guitar sounds good just because it's you know the thing's a boat anchor right uh, you know so basically somebody took a friggin cutting board and stuck a neck on it <laughs> you, you know what I mean like they, they work really well uh, because of that uh, so you know like for a good Telecaster maybe you only have to spend 500 bucks you know okay it plays as good as the one not $1,500 and it sounds just as good just needs better pickups but then you start replacing pickups and stuff that stuff adds up too right uh, sometimes you'll save money uh, but sometimes you won't right and then you get down to like the cosmetics uh, you know the fit and finish uh, that kind of stuff uh, sometimes a crude instrument is still an extra uh, excellent instrument uh, if it's super playable it might not like uh, if you look at like for example the uh, Washburn N4 and N5 guitars that Nuno Betancourt plays uh, I've played those guitars those guitars they're, they're as plain gene as a guitar can get they're dot markers they're uh, 24 fret reverse headstock and it's all natural finish and those guitars sound bloody awesome they like I, I've wanted to buy one of those for a long time just because if you've ever played a Nuno guitar you'll know what I'm talking about like they're just uh, that natural finish you just get extra sound off of it because there's no polyethylene or nothing dampening the sound right and it just sounds really good uh, and they play well you know they, they might not be the best playing guitar like I say they're very Spartan they're very bare bones but uh, you know like don't don't sweat on it you'll stain it you know what I mean like it's it, it's like, like a natural finished acoustic almost but for a solid body guitar that you want to just wail on uh, you know like there's you're paying for a really good guitar you're not paying for any crazy cosmetics but you're also going to be paying for the signature model too right but that said the some of the base models of it 
are really really good because you know you're getting just a purely good guitar there's no like you're not paying for the cosmetics at all of that guitar you know like it's it's as bare bones you know the only thing that make it more bare bones is if they didn't put the dock markers in it you know what i mean uh, on the on the fretboard that'd be the only thing um so you, you see what i mean like you can get a lot of guitar for the money you can get little guitar for the money uh you know it depends what you want so some people say it's always just about the tone and I don't really agree with that and I'll tell you why because like for example um, I just uh, upgraded my credit card now uh, to 7500 bucks okay so uh, you know got to be careful with that right and I upgraded it from two thousand dollars so I started out with a credit card about a year and a bit ago just to build my credit rating again and it was at five hundred dollars couldn't do anything with five hundred dollars uh i bought the 12 string acoustic uh the attack mine g g30 which i love the guitar but I, i'm disappointed in it because for 650 bucks i got a nice sounding 12 string that went horribly the action like last winter just went not even having the guitar for a year uh, or a year and a half and the guitar it'll be two years this March that I've had that guitar and I play that guitar like crazy and the action last winter just went like ridiculously high on it uh, it played well pretty much all spring and summer from when I bought it but that winter it just like the guitar just it, 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 it was almost to a point where you couldn't play it past say the seventh fret it was just the, the action was way too high so I had to lower the action now when I lowered the action to not even to where I want it, but to where I could get it. Uh, now the G string won't intonate. So there, I got a little trick. Uh, this is my Jack. Uh, well, that was a picture of a Jackson R5T, like I got. Uh, the pictures of it coming up. That's the SG3 right there. Uh, yeah, that guitar for 1560, and it's beautiful on top of that. So you got cosmetics, you got sound, you got playability. Uh, like it, it really doesn't get much better than that guitar. I mean the pictures don't do it justice with the wood grains like gold heart you know and the tuners are good you know like this guitar holds tuning fairly well for gibson i know some people think all gibsons are you know either great or whatever this one's really good this one's this one's beyond good this is a phenomenal guitar great recording guitar for sure uh the tronics are getting a little bit old in it whatever i'll get back to the jackson in a second but um but again bang for the buck you don't sell a guitar like that because and you don't want to you don't really want another guitar after you get a guitar like this because it does everything so well the only thing is it's not doing the metal thing well or it does it well but doesn't like i can get zach wild out of it i can get randy rhodes out of it uh i can't get symphonic metal out of it you know what i mean that's why i need the eight string and all that so uh but anyway getting back to that that uh, 12 string uh like i paid 650 bucks tax and all with an extra pack of strings and a few other little things i think it was like around 760. uh it's not bad right money wise but it didn't hold up and not only that after i adjusted the bridge uh the uh the two-piece bridge system on the tax uh the the lower uh you know the bass strings on it basically that part of the bridge doesn't work anymore so i got a guitar that no longer is electric acoustic because it's it's not functioning properly and it won't intonate and the action is you know kind of shot on it year and a half i paid a lot of money for that you know what i mean so i'm assuming i just got a flute guitar but you know uh i paid a lot of money for a guitar that didn't hold up so what's that guitar really worth right um <coughs> now that said i paid 400 bucks for my ibanez AEL 10. Now, mind you, I dropped one drop of guitar polish on the electronics of that acoustic guitar, and it shorted it out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but that guitar otherwise has been rock solid. In since 2005 to now, it's 2023, so I've had that guitar 18 years. Okay, 18 years. And in 18 years, I've done one bridge adjustment, lowering the bridge, which I might lower it again a bit but we're talking like not even taking a 16th off of it the guitar it's an acoustic it plays like an electric 
Uh, the action on it is one of the best actions I've ever had on any acoustic guitar I, I've ever played in my life, and I own it. You know, I've had one tuner last year go out on me, and I replaced that tuner because I had one sitting around. I just replaced it, uh, it stripped out or something like that. That's the only thing that's happened to it in 18 years. Out of playing, I don't know how many times, like probably a couple hundred times on stage with it, in uh, you know between 2005 and now. Uh, you know, 400 bucks, you know, for a guitar that's probably made four times that. <laughs> I've probably made about four times that with it. So what's that guitar really worth, right? So 400 bucks. So you can see what I mean. Like money doesn't always equal uh, quality. But that said, I've had, uh, you know, electric guitars, same thing, you know, where they, they either hold up really well or they don't. Uh, my 61 reissue does have a bow in the neck which uh, from the previous owner uh, but other than that it's still an amazing playing guitar it sounds great like the sg3 and all that and that guitar i got it second hand for i think 1600 and it was about 1900 or so with tax and all not bad it's sort of about the blurry pictures there but uh, that guitar you know is just a phenomenal guitar as well the, the 61 reissues are just absolutely incredible uh, sorry about the blurry pictures. I <laughs> I should probably just delete those pictures. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that was a fun jam night too. Um, the sound I got out—I was just playing that through a little Fender Junior, uh, 10 watt Fender Junior, um, and you should have heard the sound of that thing. Like you know, like the people were—you know, like it's hard to tell, but there were people up and dancing and stuff like that. You can't really see them because the lady was off. Who took the pictures for me? She, a nice gal. She took the pictures for me. And she was just off to the side. Uh, here's the tack I was talking about. So that guitar, I would like to get the, the, the upper end version of it. But, you know, I don't, the, the G series, okay, it's made in China, whatever. That doesn't really matter. If it's made in Indonesia, it's made in China, that doesn't matter. I think what might have happened is the wood probably from the, you know, you know South Pacific climate to here, you know like our hard winter was probably just too much for that you know the wood was probably not dried properly or whatever you know what i mean there was probably a lot of moisture from the south pacific so you know minus 30 minus 40 and, and even though it doesn't get that cold in the house uh what ends up happening is that it just you know winter time sucks all the moisture out of the wood right and then everything just shrinks right up and that's what gives you your wacky uh uh, wacky intonation like right now is the best time to adjust all your intonation on your guitars you know up here in Canada when it's you know the driest of the year right so this is the eight string I got now this is a sub thousand dollar guitar but probably one of the best eight strings you can get under a thousand dollars well it was uh, I think eight ninety nine and then with tax and shipping and everything like that well the shipping was free it was a thousand forty okay Canadian now for a thousand forty bucks that guitar is kind of like the Nuno guitar it's a sa it's a satin black finish so there is a finish on it but it's a satin black finish so you know keeping it cheap uh, it has the Jabota fingerboard but uh, and that's the Jackson flying V there that that guitar is just freaking wickedly awesome uh, but that that eight string okay uh, out of all the eight strings under a thousand dollars it's the only one that I, I seen that was uh, solid like you know mahogany body and neck so it's a set neck or whatever neck to body set neck uh, slightly difference but same idea you know what I mean it, it's a it's a solid solid attachment right um, and the thing about it is is that guitar it's not the best playing guitar in the world I won't, I won't lie to you uh, this guitar though <laughs> this guitar is freaking phenomenal um, plays amazing and we'll talk about this guitar in a second but but the eight string just to finish up on that uh bang for the buck it was probably the best eight string you could get under a thousand dollars uh even if it's probably not the best playing one but like if you judge it by playability sound quality uh quality of hardware all that stuff probably the best one you can get uh after that you're probably going to go to a Schecter or something like that or a better quality uh, LTD or something like that so anyway um, yeah so that guitar again I've been just really 
enjoying that eight string a lot. I'm starting to become very fluent in playing it. And it's also becoming a guitar that when I do play it, it's like bring like as a songwriting tool, like as a cover guitar, like playing top 40 cover band stuff. Maybe not so much, but playing, uh, you know, like originals. I find it just absolutely that eight string is just like that is an excellent songwriting tool, uh, which makes me want to play it more. And the thing is, it plays well enough, uh, and it it sounds great uh, for what it is. May, might not be the best sounding guitar in the world, not the best playing, but overall package, bang for the buck. I think it's a very well, uh, you know, a, a, an excellent guitar. You know, it's a guitar you could live with for many many years. Now, the only thing I would do from that guitar is go upscale. Like I would get something better. Um, you know. I would never buy an eight-string uh, that was lesser than than that one because it's like once you go up the ladder a bit with your guitars, you tend to stay there. Uh, it's always good to have a like an inexpensive, you know, sacrificial lamb of a guitar, i.e., the Jan Lake guitar, which is my JS32 Rhodes Flying V, which is a $400 guitar. Excellent guitar for the money. And uh, we'll talk about this Jackson Flying V for now. Again, even if you're not into Flying Vs, the point I'm making here is that if this guitar, okay, you can get a few versions of it, about four or five versions of this guitar, uh, of the, the RR5T. Now, at Rhodes Model Vs, there's like uh, probably 20 or 30 versions of the Rhodes V you can get in current model today. So this one is the RR5T, uh, T for Tunematic Bridge. And basically, it's tone volume two SH6 uh, Duncan distortions. Uh, oh, that's my Wheels of Fire cover. Just so you know, uh, I was getting some of those picture generators. I just I have them in the folder. So if you see stuff like this at random, that's what it is. Um, you know, for some of my songs, whatever. And anyway, uh, getting back to the Jackson, the Jackson basically, that guitar does modern very well. It's really hot pickups. Uh, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's a metal guitar. Uh, this might here come, here comes Kong uh, <laughs> avatar. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was a fun guitar uh, tune to do. I did that one with the Jackson V. So that Jackson V was uh, 1300 bucks, we'll say. Twelve hundred and eighty. It's now went up a hundred bucks uh, already. Uh, so if you're going to buy one of those, you're going to pay a hundred bucks more than what I did, uh, Canadian. Uh, and that guitar is as about as professional as a guitar can get, much like this SG3 or the SG61 reissue. Although I would say the SGs are a grade quality up, fit and finish wise from the Jackson, splitting hairs. Uh, I'd say the Gibsons because they got you know dressed frets and stuff like that. They play just a little bit cleaner, right? That said, that Rhodes V to die for. It, it's so good. Uh, it's one of those guitars where it's good enough that it makes you not want to buy any other guitars, or, or really second guess the guitars you're 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 going to buy. So when you get a guitar that's that good, what's it really worth? Like for example, the Japanese version of that RR5T is five thousand dollars or something like that canadian and the only real difference is the neck is finished with a, a satin black finish on it rather than clear uh like the one i got it's made in japan and then on top of that uh the pickups are duncan's they might be slightly different and it's got uh you know locking tuners other than that exact same guitar alder body maple neck rosewood uh ebony fingerboard um, just an absolutely stunner of a guitar. If you want to hear what that guitar sounds like, you can listen to o uh, Ola Anglin play one, do a review on one. Just type in Jackson RR5T and you'll, you'll make uh, MJ and you'll, you'll get the get his uh, his version. But that, that guitar doesn't sound any different really tonally than the one I got made in Indonesia. Um, and in all honesty, like, you know, like, why would you pay that much extra for the other one? Unless the made in Japan meat, meat, meat meant something to you. Uh, locking tuners, again, I could, if I ever upgrade the, the tuners on mine, you know, locking tuners might be about 140 bucks or maybe 200 bucks with the gold plated, you know, to match my hardware. Um, 
I don't think that that guitar, the Made in Japan guitar, would be that much better unless it had the dress frets and stuff like that. Uh, you know, like there would have to be a reason for me to want to buy that guitar. You know, uh, pay that much more, right? So, excuse me. <coughs> that said, I haven't seen that guitar myself, so I don't know uh, how much better it actually is. So, what I would say is, go into a store, okay? And again, if you draw, if you break it, you buy it, right? So just keep that in mind. So just be real gentle, but grab the upper end scaled guitars. Whenever, let's say you're into uh, Stratocasters or Les Pauls or whatever, um, grab the lowest end one and compare it to the highest end one you're willing to grab off. Like I'll grab a ten thousand dollar guitar off the shelf and play it, and I'll be like, wow, this thing plays incredibly well. It's it's so it's amazing. It sounds great. Everything like that. And then grab a guitar at like three thousand dollars. Like it, this one just plays just as good as the ten thousand dollar one, but it's, doesn't have quite the same cosmetics. Or maybe you know, like a, like say a Les Paul uh, Custom Black Beauty, right? Versus uh, the Les Paul Standard. There's not a lot of difference there. You know, there is a difference, but there's not a lot of difference there. So is it that little difference worth you know the extra three thousand dollars, right? Um, to me, maybe not, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, that said, uh, uh, guitar, a guitar that I'm looking at, like, because my, you know, like, I have to totally rethink my philosophy of guitars right now because it's like, uh, I can, afford, well, as long as I can afford the payments, I can buy guitars in phenomenal range, right? So I'm going to be buying guitars over 2000 or $3,000. Uh, what's it going to give me, right? Am I just buying name? Am I just buying cosmetics? Or am I buying a collector guitar that I don't, you know, like collector guitars neither here nor there for me because I, I don't really, I'm not a guitar collector, I'm a player, right? And it doesn't mean I'm not collecting guitars. It just means, I'm, uh, you know, my priority is to the live show, to the recording, rather than to, is this going to go up in value or down? About that said, my Gibsons have almost, well, <clears throat> The SG61 reissue is no longer uh, in issue. The closest thing is the SG61 reissue uh, satin finish, and that's a VOS model, which means vintage old stock, and that guitar is nearly $10,000. Same guitar you're looking at right now, except more in a dull finish, uh, more like the original. And anything VOS is, uh, from Gibson is, is, is like custom shop stuff. So it's it's the custom shop stuff starts pretty much $3,000 up kind of thing, right? So if that doesn't mean anything to you, it's not a guitar worth. Like, you know, like you're not going to get more guitar than this. If you recorded the both of them, that the other VOS is not going to sound any better than that one. Uh, so you, again, why would you, you know, but maybe you want the VOS as a collector. Right. <coughs> so, would there be a guitar <coughs> other than cosmetics and other than uh, brand name, other than uh, you know, other than a, you know, tone that would be worthwhile buying? Because tone, I think, only gets you so far with a guitar. You can get a great guitar, like for example, this G twelve seventy five that I used to have. That guitar sounded incredible, but it was the size of a dresser, right? But it's one of the best sounding guitars I've had. You know, more vintage classic, you know, Les Paul, SG sound, right? Uh, phenomenal sounding guitar. And again, not a lot of money considering, you know, like it was a sub thousand dollar guitar. And it was like pretty much nine ninety nine or something like that, <coughs> Canadian. And when it was done, uh, I think it was around eleven or twelve hundred dollars tax Canadian, and for that, like I mean, it was a pro guitar for that money. Plus, it had the twelve string and the six string. The six string was actually really good. It's just it wasn't the most playable guitar because it only had nineteen frets, and that the, the, those they're, they're, that six string is very awkward to play. That said, the twelve string of the double neck is absolutely stellar to play. Um, it's it's probably one of the best sounding electric 12 strings ever been and i uh you know maybe only second to the gibson one uh to the gibson uh eds 12 uh 
your 1275. So the G1275 is the Epiphone, the 12, uh, EDS 1275 is the Gibson. And I've played both of them. And I remember when they did the reissue of the 61 reissue uh, in 1992 or 94, they also reissued the double necks, I think, around that time as well. And I remember at the time the double neck was 2500 bucks. In hindsight, that was a steal, you know what I mean, uh, for what you were getting, you know. Uh, but that said, getting back to my original question there, uh, is there a guitar that would be worth, say, 2000 or 4000 you know, dollars, you know, you know, more than just cosmetics that you'd be, or name you'd be paying for. Well, there is, uh, there is, there is reasons. Let's say, okay, uh, and I'll tell you what guitar I'm thinking of right now, but uh, I'll, I'll describe it to you first. So let's say you can find a guitar, okay? Now, it's going to be a metal guitar, meaning you're going to be playing high gain amps and stuff like that. Uh, we'll just, we're just using this guitar as the, 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 the example. You can say this about other guitars that, you know, for blues or for... You know, people that just play edge of breakup stuff all the time, whatever. Um, okay, so let's say this guitar never goes out of tune. So you're a studio guy, a studio musician, and you're going to be spending a lot of time in the studio, and the last thing you want to do is be retuning between each take or halfway through a take and all that stuff. You just want a guitar that stays in tune, never goes out of tune, kind of thing. Sounds too good to be true, right? Uh, but what would you pay for that guitar? You know what I mean? Let's say live, you know, like you're playing, let's say tonight you're playing in Vancouver, tomorrow night you're playing in Montreal. Uh, and in Vancouver, it's plus 19. In Montreal, it's minus 47. <laughs> okay. Now, let's say you have a guitar that that weather difference would not make any difference to the tuning whatsoever. What's that guitar worth for you? Right? Uh, let's say you've got a guitar that when it's intonated, Okay, uh, and every guitar is the same. No matter how good you intonate it, there's always somewhere on the neck where it's going to be a little bit out. Uh, my SGs, uh, they're awesome for when you dial in the uh, the um, the intonation on like a 61 reissue or even a Les Paul or uh, my SG3. The, the, those guitars intonate so well. Uh, even up past the 12th fret and stuff like that, or the 15th fret or whatever, you could play chords there and it's they're still in tune. You know, they're still in tune. Like with my 8 string, I have to kind of, you know, adjust my finger pressure a little bit more because of the thickness of the strings. And you got to kind of pull strings in and out of tune a little bit once you get up past the 7th, uh, you know, the 15th fret. But it will go in tune, but you have to kind of compensate for it. But imagine a guitar where you didn't have to do that. Imagine a Stratocaster or a Les Paul or a Jackson V or a Dinky or an Ibanez or whatever uh, RG series that you went all the way up to like the the, the 24th fret in in a you know playing a you know like a power chord type of thing, and it was still in tune. What is that guitar worth to you? Well, what kind of guitar am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the uh, uh, Evertune guitar, guitars with Evertune bridges. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of a guitar which uh, is the LTD EC1000 7. It's a 7 string. They also make a 6 string version of it. And a couple of years ago, they made an 8 string version of it. 25 and a half scale, 7 string guitar. Uh, it's got, you know, fancy binding like a Les Paul custom. Uh, got two EMGs in there. Uh, push pull pot six way switching uh, and an Evertune bridge on it with an ebony fingerboard. It never goes out of tune. Now, that guitar is $2,100, $2,200, right? So to me, I'm like, well, you would buy that guitar. You're not going to buy 16 other little, you know, cheaper guitars after you've got a guitar like that. Once you've got a guitar like that, that's your benchmark. That's where it's like, hey, like this Hammer Diablo, this guitar was awesome. 850 bucks. Uh, now the second best sounding guitar I've ever owned. Uh, that guitar was a really good player too. Uh, the, the, my best sounding guitar I've now convinced is my, my Rhodes Flying V. Uh, and the only difference, this sounded very similar to the Rhodes V. Both are outer bodied, maple necks, uh, although that's a bolt-on, and a Floyd Rose, uh, and a Rosewood fingerboard. Uh, the Flying V has uh, the uh, what's called the uh, uh, ebony fingerboard, slight difference there, but other than that, I'd say the uh, the Rhodes V 
has a better sound mainly because it's neck through body and a fixed bridge right uh fixed bridge guitars neck through body guitars always seem to sound the best because you know I, i've explained it in other videos so you just get more resonation out of the strings and stuff like that so again getting back to a guitar that never goes out of tune on you or rarely goes out of tune on you what's that guitar worth is it worth two thousand some odd bucks to me it would be you know especially if you've ever had to tune live when you're in your room and you're playing and you got to tune your guitar you grab your tuner and you just bang 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 tunes up like you know like 30 seconds you've tuned your guitar live especially with 12 strings uh, and I've played 12 strings live enough to know that when you go on stage if that guitar is not 100% in uh, I forget the, there's a, a guy that he's a pro player uh, more like the more like uh, you know I wouldn't call him jazz or whatever but any, anyway he's a famous uh, 12 string player and I think he summed it up best he goes you spend half your life tuning a 12 string you spend your other half of a, half your life playing it out of tune and th there's a lot of truth to that it is really hard to keep one of those things tuned up and if it goes out a bit on you it seems like uh, the dreaded tuning gremlin shows up on stage and this will happen with a six string guitar it'll happen with a 12 string guitar and I've had it happen to me where you go and the audience is like talking and there's all kinds of background noise and everything like that and you go to tune and what would normally take you 30 seconds you just cannot it's like okay I think I'm slightly out next thing you know you're way out and then you try to overcompensate and then now you're even way out your tuners going wild because it's picking up the audience noise it's picking up all kinds of stuff like that and it's almost you basically got your head stuffed in the speaker your speaker trying to tune because it's just like you can't do it passively because the tuner won't pick it up because there's too many you know like the you know there's like you know the the drums are guys tapping on the drums uh, the, the bass and the, the doing stuff like that. so it's picking that up and then you got people talking in front of you and for some reason everything it just the, the the tuner doesn't it's not doing its job and you got to figure out how to tune that sucker right so that is a stress level for a musician the tuning nightmares you get live so like for me I've learned years ago show up earlier for the gig as soon as you get there grab the, the guitar that was perfectly in tune when you you put it in the vehicle but the scene you were bouncing down the, the case was probably bouncing down the highway in the vehicle you get there the guitar is horribly out of tune you tune up in the parking lot or wherever it's the quietest quietest and then you go into the room you play it for a bit it goes out of tune again because it's adjusting to the room you leave it for about an hour and you adjust it again and, and you, you know like you keep checking the tuning checking the tuning check the tune so an hour before you check you tune it up uh, you know 15 minutes later you go check the tuning again uh, another 15 minutes later you go check the tuning again. another 15 minutes you go check the tuning in then you do maybe like a warm-up song or a sound check or whatever 15 minutes before you go on stage you do one last check maybe of tuning with everybody five minutes before you go on stage everybody refines their tuning and then you play the show and you might have to touch up the tuning once or twice through the show depending on the guitar sometimes a little more a little bit less whatever it is but if you didn't have to do that <laughs> you know what I mean I know that's an awfully long explanation there but if you didn't have to do that uh, I can guarantee you you would probably want to pay more for the you would, well you wouldn't want to pay more for the guitar but you would pay more for a guitar that could do that so I'm looking at guitars now totally different where it's like okay well the bells and whistles are now within again as long as I can make the payments for it uh, you know like I'm willing to pay more for a guitar that will do that because then it, it cuts out all the cheaper guitars it really does and it's amazing how many guitars like for example this guitar was uh, about 500 bucks right and it was uh, I bought it as a jazz box to see if I would like a jazz box and I like that guitar but it really it sat there and I didn't use it hardly at all I know I did not smash it. I just took funny funny photos with it and in a nutshell um, I played this guitar live and stuff like that and it just it it recorded phenomenally well because of being a hollow body and I had jazz strings on it and had good tone in in, in the recordings uh, which I don't seem to have anymore but I, I don't know what happened to them but um, 
the one thing I would say is that the guitar itself, I bought that guitar and another $500 guitar, another $500 guitar, and then I had this thing as well. And I was sitting there looking at them, going, all that money on those guitars when I could have bought one really good one. And I did. I sold those guitars and I ended up financing my SG3. And that made me reevaluate how I buy guitars. You know, like just buying the next, you know, cheaper guitar, you're buying the same thing. Like you're not getting any better. So there has to be a reason. This is my first electric guitar here, which I got for 200, uh, 250 bucks or 350 bucks with the amp. Uh, and, you know, like for example, this Epiphone here. I bought it for with that little lamp sitting on top of the mess of boogie there for like 400 bucks or so yeah I think all all tax all the, the amp and the guitar was about 400 bucks and I bought it as jam night stuff so it's like okay a cheap $250 guitar plus a hundred dollar amp plus a gig bag and some strings it came up to about 400 bucks uh, because I didn't want to sacrifice my good guitars at the time so I bought that uh, and that guitar served me well, and it was a lot of fun. I played it, I played it on stage an awful lot because I wasn't worried about damaging it and stuff like that. So that guitar was justifiable at a cheaper price. But to record with it and all that stuff, and like I mean, it sounded okay for what it was. But it will never sound as good as what my Gibsons did. You know what I mean? Like it never did. Like it sounded good, but it didn't sound as nowhere near as good as right. So you'd say, you know, like the why spend more money on a guitar? Well, it depends what that guitar gives you, right? So that said, uh, you, you can go up the scale an awful lot just in the nuance of buying something that just is like fractionally more better. So when I hear like things like, well, the pickups don't matter that much because uh, you're playing metal. Okay, so the pickups don't matter that much. Uh, and it's like, well, they kind of do. You know, they, they kind of do because like, for example, if you're playing... Uh, high gain stuff like I mean really saturated high gain stuff uh, medium output pickups don't sound bad but they don't produce the uh, aggressive sounds that you want uh, when you start to compress right you don't get the punchiness you don't get that that bite you know whereas extremely high gain pickups sound very harsh through uh, low gain amps uh, you know what I mean like they, they just don't they just they're they're too much. Uh, they, they they you know the signal's too hot and uh, my Jackson Flying V's like that with my Hot Rod Deluxe. Uh, like on the clean channel, it sounds phenomenal. Uh, but you know the pickups are really bitey. They're really you know they're you know they're really meant for uh, you know high gain, right? So they on a tube amp that's really more of a classic sounding amp it, it's just you would think it would just make the tube sound hotter but it doesn't it actually sounds harsh believe it or not so you'd say you know that that's not the amp for that guitar that said when you start compressing uh the gain and you go a higher gain stage and those pickups are just absolutely glorious so you can see what i mean like you, you, one guitar won't do everything uh even if it does what it does phenomenally uh, so my Gibsons, they, they work well with high gain amps, but they also work well with medium gain or lower gain amps. You know, they have the clarity for the lower gain. They're not such a hot pickup like the classic 57s are a hot, they're a high gain pickup, but they're not so high gain. They're not like a Duncan distortion or something ridiculous like that, which the Duncan distortions are awesome. Uh, but you have to have an amp that compresses. So if you've got a 5150, you want the Duncan distortions for sure. If you're cranking through like say a Fender Twin or a Marshall, you might not want quite that hot of a pickup. Again, you know, if you can dial it in and get the tone, sure, whatever. But if you can't quite dial it in and the pickups are too hot, uh, even George Lynch talked about this. He was like, uh, he used to get the hottest pickups he could get, and then he noticed like it was just they were too harsh for his amps. They were frying out his amps, right? And if you have really high gain pickups uh, and you lower them down, then you lose all the the dynamic, right? So it's kind of a catch twenty two where 
uh, you want the highest gain pickups you can get, but you have to be able to compress the sound enough so that you're not burning out your transistor amp or you're even blowing tubes, right? Uh, not that it happens often, but it, it will do that. Like uh, high gain amps, will, uh, high high output pickups will uh, fry out transistor amps. Uh, you know that's why your amp dies. You know loses tone over time. It just it just you burn it out, right? You know we're talking like a decade or something like that. And it depends how loud you play and everything like that. So like a small 15 watt amp like my little Crate BTX-15, I've, I've cranked the shit out of that thing on stage so many times that, it, you know, I'm amazed it still works, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it, it still produces a pretty cool sound when it's compressed, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so again, what is, you know, like a, you know, what justifies more price? It, you know, like if you look at the overall package, okay, yeah, cosmetics you could say is subjective, right? So we can eliminate the cosmetic things, but you will pay more for a co cosmetically pretty guitar. Playability is at any price range is sometimes hit and miss. So I've played guitars that were like thousands of dollars in, in music stores and I'd be like okay it's good but it's not anything better than the, that guitar at eleven hundred dollars you know what I mean and I've seen guitars over two thousand dollars that with bass wooden and, and, and poplar bodies and I'm just like you're kidding me right like you know like at that like it, it, it's the uh, I know some not everybody believes in tone wooden I say it in every video but if you can't hear the difference don't worry about it but Trust me, at some point, you will hear the difference. And when you do, the argument goes, okay, well, the argument always goes like this. At first, you know, tone wood is bullshit uh, or it's everything, right? Uh, so the people that it's everything, it's usually guys that play straight through the amp will hear the tone wood. Uh, even with the finishes, you'll hear the difference in the finishes. Uh, a good example would be like, okay, go if you get a chance to go play those uh, Mark Holcomb guitars, the SBN sevens, seven strings, right? Go and try the one with the, the the Holcomb burst, okay, with purple and whatever. There's a new one that's out now with the blue, but try the one with the purple, okay, and, and whatever if you can find that one, and then try the other satin finish model right beside. Uh, I can guarantee you, you you will hear a difference in tone. Uh, a satin finish guitar, yes, even an electric will sound. If I talked about the Nuno guitar. It will sound different. You will hear more things off of it. Uh, but, you know, like if you want to do an apples to apples comparison, and it won't be subjective, it will be noticeable. You can say, okay, is it super, super noticeable? Maybe not, but it is noticeable that the, the less finish you have on a guitar, you know, like that's why some people argue nitrocellular slacker versus polyethylene. Now, I can contest to uh, that, that it does make a difference because that the uh, G400 Epiphone with, had the polyethylene finish. I, that, that's the blue SG you see at the beginning. It's the same guitar. It was originally red, cherry red or whatever with polyethylene. And I stripped it down and painted it uh, like a satin blue. And it, it produced a little, little extra, again, splitting hairs, but you did hear a tonal difference. Uh, it sounded a little bit better you know with less let less was more you know what i mean so yeah these things add up little things add up so tone wood is a thing uh so usually what happens is the guys that deny it they'll, they'll, they'll listen and in, in their uh and i've seen a lot of guys do that not a lot of guys but a few guys do this where here i'll show you and they they do like demonstrations and they say well okay see tone wood is not a thing at all and then it goes from tone wood is not a thing at all but or it's it's not a significant thing. You could hear a little bit of a difference. And that's the point I'm making is little differences might be a big thing for somebody, right? So the guitar that has slightly more sustain for an extra thousand bucks might be worth it for somebody. It might not be worth it for you. And usually what happens is like it will, you know, pick anything. Uh, if it's not worth it for you, you go out of your way to discourage other people that have bought mm, something more expensive. If it is worth it for you, you, you go out of your way to de demean anybody that has not risen to your level, right? So I'm like, I'm like one of those guys like, no, no, you don't have to go. You don't have to, you know, be right. You have to say, is it right for me? You know, like, so for me, uh, I can look at a, a really expensive guitar and say, yeah, that guitar would be awesome to have because it can do all these things. 
you know, but what is your priority? You know, like, what, you know, is it the tone? Is it the playability? Is it, uh, you know, okay, I'm willing to give up a bit of tone for a better playing guitar because if you play better, um, you know, another argument that you always hear is, well, the audience, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, you're playing to a, like a fifth grade level of understanding of, of, of tone and, and music. So if your audience hears you playing well on a $250 G400, they're not going to care that you have a, you know, the Gibson SG right beside it, right? But if you got one guy on the stage with playing through the exact same amp and same settings, and you have one guy with the G400 uh, Epiphone SG and the other guy with the 61 reissue Gibson SG, almost everybody, even the layman, is going to say that Gibson sounds so much better. Uh, because it's not subjective at that point. You've got more clearer pickups, higher output, uh, better dynamics, uh, better tone wood, better, you know, the f less, you know, better fret quality. Uh, as long as the guitar players are playing to the best of their ability, you will hear that difference. You know, you will hear that difference. So you'd say, okay, well, that guitar is probably obviously going to be more expensive just because. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and it's not. Like, you know, like, like, like I say, my Jackson Flying V. You know, it's need not want after that guitar. If you're a metalhead and you buy that guitar, that's all the guitar you'll ever need. Maybe you buy two of them just so you have a backup for the stage performance. But other than that, like, you know, like, it doesn't get much better than that. You know, okay, if it gets better than that, it's a little bit better. So, okay, you got a guitar that stays in tune a little bit better. Or you got a guitar, like I say, that a uh, uh, little higher output, a little more output, or it has a, a push pull pot. You know, like little stuff like that. But so you don't have to pay, spend ten thousand dollars to get a good guitar. That's not what I'm arguing. But what I'm arguing is there is reasons why people do buy more expensive guitars, especially people that are making money with the guitars. You know, like so if you're a guy like me who's like basically not in a band and whatever, why would you justify buying an expensive guitar? Well, you know, you can go out and buy cigarettes, you can go out and buy booze, you can go buy drugs, you can go buy a lot of things. To waste your money on i'd rather waste my money on something okay let's say i buy a two thousand or three thousand dollar guitar okay the first year it's a big hit to my pocket there's no doubt about that or you know to my credit card still hits hits my pocket right uh but i have this guitar for 10 years three thousand dollars is not a lot of money over 10 years you know what i mean so to the you know the the starving student or the you know the kid that's still at home yeah okay you know You've been playing a couple of years, maybe that $3,000 guitar is not really practical for you. But I'm talking about people that, okay, you, you have the option, you're working, okay, so you're working, you can make payments on a guitar that's outside your price range, but you, you can at least make the payments for a year or so, whatever it is. Uh, it might be worth it for you if you're not going to buy 10 guitars. Uh, you know, buying that one good guitar might save you from buying 10 cheap guitars. You know, that you know, if it suits your needs, and you'll see guys like, for example, Ingve. Uh, uh, like for example, he ha all he has is pretty much Stratocasters. I'm sure he probably like in the closet he has like a an Ibanez or something like that that he just doesn't show people, whatever. Uh, maybe you know, I've seen him playing a Les Paul. He said, "Cool guitar," but I, does he actually own one? I don't know. Uh, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Right. Angus Young, he's got like a thousand SGs, something something ridiculous like that. He has like a thousand SGs, but he plays like five of them. You know, you know what I mean? Like he plays five of them. Why? Because they, they serve him well. He knows those guitars. It's, it's good enough for him. Uh, a guy who I really like uh, sound-wise, uh, if you want to hear a really cool sounding metal guitar, the song is called, it's by Nightwish, it's called uh, Bye Bye Beautiful. It's uh, the, Listen to the Mesa Boogie uh, sound there with that uh, L LTD EC5 or ESP uh, EC1000 that he's played uh, electric guitar just listen to that guitar it is just it's a killer tone to die for uh, and if you price those guitars out they're like between two and uh, two and three thousand dollars right and and uh, four thousand dollars for like the ESP and the uh, elite model uh, elite two models and but just listen to that thing <laughs> you know what i mean and everywhere you hear like if you look at all the metal guys they're all playing esp guitars uh typically schecter and esps that's mainly what you see why are they playing those guitars well listen to the sound of those damn things uh they all weigh like boat anchors uh like the heavy guitar the heavy mahogany guitars 
they just sound great. You know what I mean? Um, that's like a lot of people say, like the older Le pre 1980s Les Pauls sound better than the newer ones. Uh, well, there's more wood there because it wasn't until the 1980s where they started doing the weight relief. Because I remember when I had my Epiphone Les Paul, it was it was like a 13 pound guitar. It was it was a boat anchor, right? And it was like, why is this guitar so heavy in comparison to the Gibson? Well, the Gibson has like weight relief in it, so what they do is they they uh, hollow out like nine pockets underneath the the the, the top, which re reduces the weight. So maybe you want to play a Les Paul live really bad for, but you have to play it for three hours. So a guitar that weighs eight pounds versus a guitar that weighs uh, uh, you know thirteen pounds or fourteen pounds, maybe that extra three thousand dollars is worth it for you, uh, or not extra three, but that 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 three thousand dollars is worth it for you simply due to the fact that it it. Uh, you know it plays um, you know it's lighter to play so so for some people that like you know again basswood body and popular body guitars they might not sound as good but they're nice and light you know what I mean so maybe you're willing to give up a bit of tone for light weight and then you get a guitar that weighs like three and a half pounds or something like we'll say four pounds a uh, ridiculous light guitar and you're like okay well that guitar is five thousand dollars because it's so light it's a carbon fiber guitar or something like that maybe that's worth it for you you know what I mean? So there's a lot of reasons why people buy really expensive guitars. And I think rather than trash talking whether you didn't spend enough on a guitar or you spent too much on a guitar, like look at the guitar for what it is and say, you know, is that justifiable for what I'm doing? If the answer is no, you just walk away from it. But what I also say is when you walk into a music store, any music store that will allow you to grab any guitar off the wall, you grab any guitar off the wall. And that's how you really notice the difference of quality uh, playability, sound, and all that uh, between one guitar and the next. And most guitars you're going to leave on the wall. Uh, you know, like uh, I've got a, the way I test the guitar, and I'll just finish up on this is I walk in, I grab the guitar, and I strum it acoustically. I, I don't plug it in. And I play it a little bit, and I judge the neck. Okay, the neck, how is it? Is it smooth? How's the fretwork? All that stuff. Okay, it's not bad. Uh, you know, how the, you know, is there any dead spots on the fingerboard? that kind of stuff and then I grab the guitar before the guitar after and I compare that okay well this guitar seems to project a little bit better and the one that's of the three that sounds better I'll plug in you know and then okay maybe I'll grab the other and I'll plug it in oh, okay well you know and I'll play them back and forth and then I'll go one in a higher price bracket a lower bright price bracket and just compare things and that, that's how you find your perfect guitar and a lot of times it's the guitar you least expect and it's the guitar that just surprises you out of nowhere and most of the time it's nowhere near the price you think it would be uh, it's either going to be way more expensive than you thought or way cheaper than you thought so the idea is to you know get yourself the best deal you can by getting what you want anyway I'll leave it at that so have yourselves a great day eh?